started here. Uh, appreciate everybody uh, making yourselves available today, and certainly the folks that are watching online. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, I'm Trey Stewart, Senate Republican leader, joined with our House colleagues here. Uh, this is going to take a little bit of a different format. It's more of a press availability to talk about uh, any questions you folks have on uh, some of the things that were unveiled over the last 48 hours or so. Um, I certainly want to start off and reiterate a couple of the things that I said uh, on Tuesday uh, about what's been proposed so far. The first is the governor used the first you know, third or so of her proposed letter, and again, this is kind of clunky because it was presented with a letter and then a speech, but on the letter side, three pages of basically gaslighting the people of the state of Maine and thinking that the economy is great. It's not great. I, I, I don't know anybody that thinks it's doing well, even. Inflation is through the roof under Democrat control both at the federal, state level. That's a result of bad, failed, liberal policies. When folks have less uh, money in their paychecks than they have uh, bills coming in. We are not in a great shape economically. And so you can cherry pick whatever statistics that you want to try to justify a position and, and convince folks that you've somehow done something impressive. That's not reality. The main people know that's not reality. Our constituents know that's not reality. And we know that's not reality. Um, the only other thing I want to touch on before uh, turning it over to uh, Billy Bob, is one of the things I'm really disappointed in is a lack of a plan and lack of a leadership, particularly around nursing homes and those who are dependent on the state doing its job and fulfilling its promise. I've got a map here that demonstrates all of the closures around the state that are happening in these nursing homes, including some in my district. And when that happens, it's going to continue to be a problem for our economy because those folks need a place to go still. Where are they going to end up? Probably with their children, if they can. And so that's going to be even less folks that are going to be able to go out and actually work and engage in our economy. And of course, the almost ha over half of folks in, uh, in Maine that could be working, could be working more, are not right now. And that's, again, another result of failed liberal policies that's a drag on our economy that's making everything more expensive. Uh, and is not being addressed by this governor and certainly not by this legislature. And it's something that Republicans are going to continue to push for. And after we've taken control back in the legislature later this year, uh, actually do something about it. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, my House colleague, uh, Representative Paul Keehan. Okay, thank you, Trey. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll try to go over this uh, review of Tuesday's State of the State real quickly, because I do have a couple speakers I want to get to. Uh, the state of the state is in poor condition. For six years, Democrats have been in control, and as I said in my response Tuesday, uh, it's a house of cards ready to fall. It's, it's built on uh, money printed in Washington, D.C. Uh, the state of the state was a missed opportunity. The governor missed the opportunity to address so many of the real issues Mainers are facing. She didn't address the cost of living that has increased so much and is supporting our expanding government, consuming household budgets. She didn't address that citizens need to keep more of what they earn by lowering taxes. Citizens want to decide what kind of cars they drive. And we need to lower electric rates. I mean, this is the stuff you hear people talk about, and it wasn't addressed, it wasn't touched on. Uh, there are policy areas where we, we can find some common ground. The House Republicans are committed to working with the administration on storm relief. Uh, we have made some proposals to the governor, as much as $150 million for that, um, by her proposal. Uh, was to raid the rainy day fund. I guess we're going to have to find out more details on on why that was the case when we have such a big surplus. Um, and mental health, that's something that we had a press conference two or three weeks ago. A lot of what the governor said sounded like what Senator Moore was saying a couple weeks ago. So we were glad to see that some Republican proposals had made it in the state of state. That was uh, one part we could agree on. Um, However, there are things that Republicans have proposed that Democrats are ignoring. A bill by Sheila Lyman to 
put a suicide hotline on child ID cards still sits on the appropriations table. Uh, why is it sitting there? We feel like it's pettiness that uh, Democrats are just unwilling to work with Republicans on anything. Um, and Lewiston. The state of the state basically boiled down to the Lewiston tragedy. On October 25th, uh, when the shooter went into the bowling alley, Jason Walker was in the first lane in the bowling alley. He did the bravest thing imaginable. He went towards the shooter. He grabbed the shooter's gun, saved who knows how many lives he saved by engaging the shooter with an incredible act of heroism. Uh, his sister reached out to me and said that Jason was a patriot and would not want his death used from gun control. Uh, before funerals had even happened, liberals and people in these halls had jumped into the gun control mode. Um, there were 50 homicides in Maine last year. It was a, a record number. But 40% of those were committed by one person. In everything that I've heard, I haven't heard a single one of these gun control proposals that would have addressed what Robert Card did. If these were bad ideas before Robert Card, they're bad ideas after Robert Card. Nothing has changed about these ideas. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave that up to a couple gentlemen who would like to get into further detail on that. Now, uh, I'm going to bring up Representative Perkins, followed by Representative Arnell, to explain why these are bad ideas. Thank you, Representative Chad Perkins. Um, reiterating what Representative Parkingham said, um, these are bad ideas. Um, we haven't seen the bills yet, so we don't know all the details, but, you know, this legislature has addressed the issue of uh, universal background checks before. They were bad ideas when they were brought to us before. They were bad ideas now. Um, the Democrats' push for a universal background check is nothing more than a uh, attempt to create a gun registry. Um, it's not the same as when you go and you run a next check when you go to a dealer, um, because there there is no mechanism for that uh, data to be stored when you run a background check. In order for a universal background check to work, they would have to create some sort of mechanism where they store that data. And a, uh, a, a gun registry is not lawful. It's not authorized under the Gun Control Act 1968, and we actually have a law in Maine that prohibits that. And that's that's what this is. It's nothing more than a run around to try to um, get around those laws. And additionally, um, it wouldn't have stopped anything that happened here in this state. You know, the governor mentioned that, you know, everything has changed in this state after that. And that tragedy did happen. It was a tragedy. Um, I wish it hadn't happened. You can't replace those lives. And it's awful that that happened. But Maine is still a safe, a safe state. Just because of one incident, it doesn't change how safe the state is. People lose focus because we live in this, this great state where it is safe. And they lose focus to the fact that, you know, every weekend in Chicago, more people are murdered um, in just one weekend than the lives that were taken on that one day in, in, in Lewiston. And to go and say that, you know, everything is changing now, Maine is going to become this great, unsafe state, that's not true. And yes, it can happen again. We knew it could happen the first time. But that's not going to change the nature of our state. It's not going to change our culture here in Maine. And it's not going to change the nature of our people. Um, we're still a safe state. We're still a state that has a um, rich, uh, rich tradition in hunting and um, gun safety. And, you know, that, that's our culture here in Maine. And we need to protect that. We need to protect the rights of Maine citizens when it comes to that culture. And these reactionary um, bills that are proposed without even seeing the results of, of what caused this tragedy in Lewiston, without even seeing a report back from this commission um, that the governor has convened to, to address that, it's nothing more than, again, it's reactionary and it's an attempt to push an agenda um, with bills that we looked at before that were bad before and again they're bad now. Thank you. My name is Donnie Ardell. I represent House District 6. Um, as a 25 year law enforcement retiree, I can say with absolute certainty that background checks are, are really only subject to people that subject themselves to them. Um, and that would be the law by uh, People who do not or would not pass a background check do not subject themselves to them. So any type of universal background check law that would go into effect 
uh, that was the governor's suggestion would merely inconvenience uh, Mainers, law-abiding Mainers, with, with additional cost, additional travel time, and inconvenience. Um, I, I find it somewhat reprehensible that even before the uh, Lewiston Committee that's investigating uh, what happened there on October 25th has even come back with a response that, that you know, there are legislators and even the governor who comes forward with suggestions to try and fix something that has not yet been fully investigated. And, and with that, that I close. Um, but I think Republicans remain committed to protecting individual civil rights arms that may not enjoy. We'll uh, take some questions and pros. I'm sure you have many, and we have uh, different members here, here too that we might hand off to as well. If you um, I've heard this referred to as a universal background check, but it sounded like the governor was uh, really careful to exempt transfers um, that are not advertised among, like, family and friends. And, I, and I'm not sure how this proposal would create a gun registry. Maybe I could get some more information on that. How do background checks create a, a gun registry? I'd, I'd be happy to speak to that. Um, background checks are conducted by a federally licensed dealer. So to kind of get into the mechanism of it, when a dealer does a background check, particularly under the legislation that, that we saw last session and presumably with what the governor suggested, the dealer has to take in that firearm on their acquisition. The dealer needs to keep records that are available to government. So when the dealer takes in that firearm, they put them on the acquisition side of their records. And then when they do the background check, they and, and presumably the background check is, is, uh, is positive and they can transmit the firearm, they take the firearm and they put it on the disposition side. That retains information about the make, model, serial number, and caliber of the firearm, and the person who provided it to them as part of the acquisition, and the person to whom they provided it as part of the disposition. So those records are, are available to federal and state officials. But meanwhile, a gun registry is illegal at the federal level, and it's illegal at the state level. So what the government is doing in the case of these background check laws is they're attempting to end around the, the prohibition from keeping a, a registry, enforcing that registry to be kept in dealer records to which they have full access 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But, but they do these background checks already for licensed firearm dealers. I mean, how how is that, how is this any different other than I'm bringing in a gun and having them run the background check? I mean, the gun, the background check, I assume it has to be documented normally. How's that? Different? Firearms transfers between non-family members or even non-commercial transfers when someone is selling their own property happens all the time. You um, mentioned, I'm not talking about firearm, licensed firearm dealers. They have to do the background checks already. How is this proposal any less legal in that regard? Well, this would force private citizens, private exchanges between neighbors to go through a dealer to conduct to, to the background check. Well, I understand so that. But the registry, I mean, aren't they already getting that information for new firearms? Yes, Absent with, yeah, with new firearms. New firearms. This, would, this would extend this into all, practically all firearms. So your system. position now is the background checks as they currently exist for licensed firearm dealers are a violation of federal laws because they're building a registry? Um, I, I was a firearms dealer for 18 years. Um, I can only think of once that someone who subject, subjected themselves to a background check failed it, and I suspect that person um, was testing the system, knowing full well that they couldn't pass the check. So what happens is, is that people who can't pass the background check just don't subject themselves to it. Well, no, but I'm asking about let, the let, let me finish. If the law was to go into effect, people who wouldn't pass background checks would continue not to subject themselves to it. And so the only thing it would do is create this, this cost, inconvenience, and travel time for, for lawful citizens who don't need the background check in. So what would the, what would the, what would the, what would the what, ideal... I just want to answer that real yeah. quick. Uh, what we're suggesting, Randy, is the only way to prevent a gun registry is by preventing universal background checks. And what I would say to that is that Robert Card passed background checks when he purchased those firearms. So this whole idea that this is something that address Robert Card just doesn't apply. So what would the ideal... So how do you know that there aren't protections in this bill to prevent something like a registry? So, so to that point, right, I think as it relates to uh, this specific proposal that is aired on Tuesday night, uh, I do think the devil will be in the details. There are legitimate concerns around who is going to be uh, 
uh, required uh, and under what circumstances that event is triggered for folks who are transferring a firearm from one person to another. It is no doubt a shift of where we are right now in state law. There's no question around that. Uh, you are required to get a federal background check if you go and buy a gun through a manufacturer every single time, or a suppressor. Uh, this would be a shift away from that, and there are legitimate questions around when that's triggered and when that's not. And I think that that is the, the, the key point here is, let's see what the bill actually says, and then we can start to do an analysis of what events would trigger that search be, or, or that uh, check being required. So I, I don't want to overstate here uh, that we need more details, but we need more details in, in, in order to be able to say definitively what scenarios would be uh, implicated and what ones wouldn't be. So you guys, what would the ideal? Dave Trahan. You guys know Dave Trahan, obviously. He has, you, know, <laughs> you guys, he has said that in his eyes, these don't look like they're universal background checks. And you guys keep referring to them. As if he's seen a proposal, I'd love for him to share it. I haven't, right? I've seen what I think everybody else here has seen, which is, and, and heard from the governor, what her list was uh, in the speech, and then uh, the, the, the very quick bullet points that came out after that. But that's not a bill, right? And what I want to do is an analysis of actually when uh, this would be uh, a requirement under main law before we say definitively one way or another. Look, I don't think you're going to have any argument from anybody in this building that bad people and people that are prohibited shouldn't have access to firearms. There's no there's no argument there, right? They have given up their constitutional rights and they have done certain things that make them a prohibited person. That said, we, we need to actually do an analysis here of what sort of things are going to actually trigger that and who to, and then where that's going to exist after the fact, right? Whose responsibility is that going to be after the fact? So what would the ideal gun safety or gun right legislation uh, look like to you guys? I think we already have a very safe state here in Maine under the current system. Right? Again, prohibited folks are already prohibited. It, it, and that wasn't even the case in this shooting, right? So that using this shooting as a justification to do completely unrelated things is, is getting a bit far afield. However, if there are places that we can maybe make some improvements, I'm open to hearing those. Senator Herrick, uh, I think got uh, some ideas on that as well. well I, just, I just wanted to kind of answer your question. I think the issue when it comes to it's the enforceability of that law. So without some sort of gun registry, how would you then enforce these background checks? Which is, I think is kind of our, our concern is how, how would you enforce this state law without some sort of registry? Because without some sort of registry, People can still do private sales all the time. There's no way to check them. There was, there was no background check. Well, how do they enforce the current background? Would, would it, why would it be any different? Because you can't. Because you can't I can't go to a, I can't go to a federal firearms dealer. That'd be a crime to, to go in for them to not do a background check. Currently, with private sales happen all the time, without some sort of registry, how would state government enforce this new law? And that's that's where we worry about a registry. Is how would it be enforced? Yesterday, we saw the uh, Judiciary Committee unanimously uh, vote out of committee the, uh, the bill to give the subpoena power to uh, the Lewiston Commission. What are, what are you guys' thoughts about, where do you stand on, on that? I'm, I'm glad you asked that. I, I'm fully in support of that. I think, I think a lot of why we're, we're so hesitant with these, these proposals is we still don't even know what happened in Lewiston. Uh, some of what we do know um, already is in these proposals. They would have done nothing to stop that incident. But we still have a lot to learn about that incident. We would like to hear uh, you know, everything that happened, and certainly we don't want to get in the way of, of giving that commission the ability to figure out everything that happened. Speaking of commission, one of the things they're looking at is the use of the yellow flag law. What the governor's proposing is loosening up that first step to allow police to take someone to protect their custody, even if they haven't committed a crime, but they're you know, going to a judge saying, this person's dangerous. We'd like to take them into uh, custody. You guys have views on what the governor's proposing there? So, so I won't. I won't speak for everybody. I have, I have serious concerns with that. You know, I, I'm hearing regularly from, from certain folks. You know, one particular sheriff, in Southern Maine, uh, that, that says it's too difficult. Well, I, I personally think it should be difficult to deprive someone of their Second Amendment rights. It should be difficult to deprive someone of their civil liberty. 
and that's currently what we have is due process. Anything you roll back, move due process, and you move people to civil liberties. Yeah, there's, a, there's a fine line, too, right, between folks that are in serious crisis that need an immediate interjection, right, and the, the, the angry ex-spouse, right, who might make a call and say somebody is, is uh, you know, making a threatening comments and therefore go remove their firearms, right? And so, and here's the thing, right, the second that we put in place a system, and it is abused because it was shoddy work done by the legislature or the governor, that's going to get challenged in court, and then we're not going to be left with anything, because we'll lose, because there are constitutional protections. So I think that the work that was done originally around this issue was really important, because it got as close to that constitutional line as you can come without crossing it. And if, as a result, and as you heard the governor mention in her speech, it's been used more and more frequently now because more people know about it. So I think part of it was an awareness thing. But even in the Lewiston case, again, this is a really bad example to justify changing policy because it was probably a human error here. You could have implicated some form or some use of yellow flag given what was happening. The guy was in a mental institution and he was released. There was a communication. There should have been checks that didn't happen. There are things that are details to Senator Heron's point. We need to figure out exactly what went wrong here, what human error was or wasn't involved in the choice to or not to remove any firearms from Mr. Carr's possession. But I don't think that you justify doing a broad sweeping uh, change of law that then could possibly uh, uh, inject a uh, uh, constitutional strike on the whole thing, which is what my concern is. You want to have an effective law that actually works and will pass constitutional muster. I think that's what we have right now, but we need to make sure that it's actually being rolled out in a way that makes sense. Do you think there's any repercussions for law enforcement or the government or any of the officers that didn't follow through on those checks? I, I don't want to comment on that until the, the investigation has actually been done and the details are fully out there because I, I don't think it's fair to say what did or didn't happen in every case, or who failed or who didn't fail in their job without knowing what the details were. So I, I, I wish the commission, I think that's why you saw it at Corey's point earlier, why you saw broad bipartisan support for this, because we want to get all the facts out on the table as soon as possible to then be able to answer some of those tougher questions if we, we really don't have the information to be able to do so right now. I have a, a budget question. Now, you brought up nursing homes. Um, so I'm going to do a two-part question if I can. Well, all right, Randy. <laughs> so the first one is, uh, what Republican, what proposal have you guys put forward to address the nursing home issue? And then the second part of that question is, any thoughts on Mill's proposal to create a temporary savings account for $100 million and use $50 million from the rainy day fund to address storm damage? I'll, I'll answer the last question first. I, I, I really think that's uh, some gamesmanship with the, the, the numbers there. Um, part of what will happen, right, is... If, if, if it goes into the, if, if you take money out in this case, even though there's money on the table that we could use to just do this, what it'll mean is, uh, first off, there's a cascade, and this is going into the weeds, right? There's a cascade that extra revenues that are supposed to flow through into that that don't all go to the rainy day fund. But beyond that, down the road, you would then have to have an affirmative action by the legislature in order to take that money back out. So I think what she's really doing is trying to justify uh, setting up long-term spending that doesn't touch the rainy day fund, but otherwise should go to the rainy day fund, and that's why she's kind of swirling away this other pot of money. Um, as it relates to uh, the, the nursing home issue, there's a $96 million gap in these folks, okay? I haven't heard of a penny flowing to those folks to provide them with the solution, right? We did some back of the napkin math, and there is some money left over, but it's not $96 million left over. And so, again, if we're not going to pay that bill, bear in mind, the number one payer of nursing homes is, in fact, the state of Maine through Maine County. That's our responsibility. And if there's a shortfall there, because Democrats, same Democrats have also made it more expensive to keep their homes, pay their staff, keep the lights on, comply with regulations, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which they have done, but they're not willing to pay the tab on the back end, 
the only option there is for that those folks to close, and then those people would not have a place to go, creating even more stagnation on our economy and workforce. So uh, I think there's a serious problem that's going right now. We need to find a way to address it. We can find a way to address it right now. But it requires a plan and it requires leadership, and that's something I haven't seen yet. I'm all set on my end, so uh, thanks everybody. I appreciate uh, your, uh, your willingness to join us today, and uh, we'll be back into kind of our normal flow next week. Uh,